Hello and welcome to Dave Cooper Live, where we showcase the people, the products, and the processes building it better. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Brian Sayre, VP of Business Development at Built. Formerly with Prodigy Works and Shadow Ventures, Brian has significant experience in finding new white space opportunities, developing new products, and validating startups for venture capital investments. Now, he is applying the principles of innovation and disruption to the commercialization of an automated modular construction company comprised, com promising to deliver friction-free construction to truly disrupt the industrialized construction sector. Is it even possible? But before we can talk about that, we will learn about why a broken process cannot be fixed. It has to be torn down. If 99.9% .9 of today's innovation falls under the bucket of incremental innovation, does that mean our destiny is to be only incrementally better? So who has the power to disrupt the world's oldest industry, one that lags behind every other in terms of innovation? Well, we're going to talk about all that and more, but first, we have to thank all of our sponsors, and we're going to start off with Carson Holmquist and the team at Stream Logistics. They are experts in high-stakes freight, and they are the perfect choice for projects with timelines and specific delivery sequences, shipments with high complexity and unique constraints. The new methods of construction needs new transportation solutions, and they are up for the challenge. Visit them at streamlogistics.com. And a big shout out to Paul Short and Combi Lift. They're the largest global manufacturer of multi-directional forklifts and straddle carriers, a leader in long load handling solutions, offering a free warehouse and site optimization services. More than 50,000 CombiLift units have been sold in over 85 countries since CombiLift was established in 1998. CombiLift helps companies of all sizes in every industry maximize their capacity, safety and efficiency of their warehouse and storage facilities. Learn more at combilift.com. And this is a perfect conversation for today because we also have Brave Control Solutions. We're offsite manufacturing systems that do more than just improve productivity. They have a unique approach to industrialized construction, a lineup of flexible automation systems specifically designed for the construction industry empowered by CAD to FAB and turnkey solutions for 3D volumetric assembly, structural insulated panels, finished wall assemblies, MEP component processing, assembling, kitting, and storage. Go check them out at thinkbrave.com. All right, now we're going to hop right into it with everybody. Let's please welcome Brian to the show. Brian, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well. Dave, I got to say that uh, intro music you play kicking off this show, it has to get your guests hyped up. If you would have seen you me like in the uh, fishbowl, I was jamming out on this and I'm ready to go. <laughs> I, I do it all the time. Sometimes I forget the show starts and next thing you know, here I am. I'm like, oh, Bobby wow, we're live. And all of a sudden. <laughs> well, that's, that is kind of the fun of it. This is going to be a great show, Brian. So thank you so much for joining us today. Before we hop into all this glam and glitter of what innovation is and what's disrupting the industry and all the great things that you're doing, we want to know everything about you from the moment you were born to this very moment in time. Do not leave out any of the good stuff from the hospital, or we will call it your mother. You got two minutes to do it, and then after you're done, we'll hop into what's happening in the future of construction. Go for it. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for having me today. Uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be here. The content that you and Jen produce and create is really exceptional. I mean, you all are everywhere talking to everyone. And I think really providing that thought leadership and education that the entire industrial construction space needs as we emerge and continue to grow as an industry together. So, you know, to be included among those guests is a real honor and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. But, you know, a little bit of background about me, uh, my path to getting here today is, is definitely not traditional. Um, I'm not an architect, not an engineer, don't come from a building construction management background. Um, I actually went to school for business, graduated with a master's in entrepreneurship, uh, thought I wanted to be the next Mark Zuckerberg while I was in school. Um, and through that, discovered that I had a real passion for innovation within a lot of different sectors, just innovation broadly, and what that meant for industries and how it could potentially impact them and drive change throughout them. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in corporate innovation, uh, doing everything from working on the bathrooms of the future to uh, actually inventing candies that are now in market today. 
Uh, spent some time working in corporate venturing, helping large corporations invest in startups or form strategic partnerships with them rather than necessarily developing all of that internally on their own. Uh, and then in a way kind of came home. Uh, I started working in venture capital, a venture firm called Shadow Ventures that uh, invests in built environment seed stage technology companies. Uh, my family growing up, my dad owned an HVAC business down in South Florida. My oldest brother now runs that company. And so I uh, grew up in and around construction my entire life and kind of came back to it. Uh, working at the venture capital firm, got exposed to a lot of the new and emerging technology that was coming up within the built industry. Uh, and whether that's big data, clean and smart tech, generative and computational design, uh, kind of the convergence of different industries with insure tech and construction tech and fintech kind of morphing into to one common space. Uh, but just through that research and, and through hearing hundreds of startup pitches, grasped onto industrial construction as the specific sector that I viewed that had the most disruptive potential out of really everything else I was seeing in the space. Uh, and so when the opportunity presented itself to join the team that builds, I saw what they were working on there, saw what they had put together um, and was just absolutely blown away by it. Uh, and so when there was an opportunity to join that team and help them go to market and commercialize this, this incredible factory, I couldn't say no to it. And it's been the best career decision I've ever made. And uh, I've learned more there. And uh, the time that I've been with the company that I, I have really at any point in my career to date. Yeah. You know, here, here's what's great about this, right? You grew up in the industry. You weren't in it your entire life. You jumped in and out, you know, depending on what it was. And now you're back in our industry, bringing all of these different viewpoints, not only from a construction standpoint, but also from an investor standpoint which I think is a super, super valuable tool. So Brian, we appreciate that. And we appreciate having you in our industry. Uh, you guys are making some waves and you know I'm looking forward to hearing more about builds in, in, in the near future. But today we're gonna be talking about innovation and maybe some of the principles that you're starting to apply where you're working now. But quick question, you refer to yourself as a millennial uh, anarchist. What is a millennial anarchist, please? Um, so I, I came up with that term because I, I did come to this industry always with a little bit of a outsider perspective, um, coming and working in other industries and then applying that to the built industry. And I think a lot of people here will probably agree the way we design, construct, and in some ways operate real estate assets is, is completely broken. It, it doesn't make sense. It's a process that's mired with bureaucracy. Um, laden with tradition and quite frankly has a project schedule that doesn't really allow for the adoption of new innovation in a pretty seamless way. And so I came up with the concept that to fix that process, the best way to do it is actually to tear it back down rather than trying to yeah. fix it piece by piece. Right. All right. And we're going to hop into all of that. But right now, everybody, we are live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter. So get your tweets on out there. And if you're not hitting that like button right now for this show today, please do. And if you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please go there and subscribe after the show. And if you're not following what Brian is doing, you need to go follow him on LinkedIn, connect with him. If you've got innovative ideas or you're doing something great, I'm sure he'd like to hear about it as well. All right, Brian. So here we are. Let's get into this, right? We're going to talk about innovation and industrialized construction, right? So what does what does innovation to you mean? So innovation is a is a pretty buzzy word, and it has been for the better part of a decade. Um, it's a word that's thrown around in a lot of titles and a lot of different places and every company out there probably has innovation somewhere in their pitch deck or their investor presentations but i, I broadly bucketed into two main categories the first being incremental innovation that's 99.999 percent of innovation out there uh, really that's improvements to existing products services or processes to create incremental value for whatever audience you're trying to communicate that towards um, the other big bucket is I think the more interesting type, but the much rarer type, and that would be true disruptive innovation, which really has some seismic implications for all the stakeholders. And when you look at it, a ripple effect up and down the value chain. Um, if you think about companies that have really been disruptive in the past two decades or decade, the first one that comes to my mind a lot of times is Apple. 
Um, they're an obvious example, but they're a good one because it, it really clearly demonstrates that ripple effect. And specifically, if you look at Apple and the smartphone space, there were smartphones before Apple came out with the iPhone. There was the BlackBerry and there were, there were a few others. Their real disruption, though, wasn't so much the iPhone as it was the App Store. And what the App Store then enabled was this device to be so much more than just a phone or calendar manager or emailing tool. And when the App Store came about, it then led to the rise of hundreds, if not thousands of companies that now have unicorn valuations, public and private, all because of one simple innovation. And so those are the disruptions that happen. And when they happen, it really has a cataclysmic effect throughout the entire industry. BlackBerry hardly exists anymore. Nokia hardly exists anymore. Uh, if you get outside of like the Wall Street bets type <laughs> scenarios, right. and it gave right. way for the rise of companies like Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and more. Uh, so, so without that, that, that is a disruptive point in time. So why, why are we lagging behind in our industry when it comes to innovation, disruption? Like, I, I get it. Like, everybody else just seems to be making leaps and bounds and making all these intelligent decisions. And they got these little unicorns sitting out there, like you said, all over the place in the app store. But we seem to be behind everybody. What's your thoughts on that? That is, a, it is an extremely loaded question. Um, there, there's a lot of different avenues we could go down with that. Um, I guess starting on the, the positive side of it, besides blips in the industry, real estate, construction, design, it's a very, very busy industry. It's project to project based. And when you work in a space like that, it doesn't leave a lot of time for innovation because you don't necessarily have time to look back at past projects to figure out how you could have maybe done it better to then apply that in the future with how you could use a new technology because you finish a project and you're essentially picking up your next project. And so when you don't have that time to invent and to create, it's really hard to bring innovation into that industry in general. Um, there's a, a lot of other reasons behind it, but that's, that's a big bucket one that, that kind of sticks out to me. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, we are so busy, you know, obviously building and, and doing what we do. Um, but I, I also, right now, there's a, there's a big bullseye on this industry right now. There's a yep. big bullseye on who, who's going to do what and how we're going to get there. Uh, and, I, and I think that's because of where we are in last place. And, and I know we, we didn't kind of talk about it a little bit. What is your, what, in your mind, what is the bullseye? Like why, why is there such a focus on the construction industry right now? One would be sustainability and clean tech. I think yeah. that's people are really starting to pay attention to that. It's been the automotive industry leading the charge, but now the electrification of the building industry is definitely coming to the foreground. Um, another is the labor shortage. We all know that there's not people my age entering this workforce. And when the next generation, the older generation retires, who's going to fill that need? And I think one of the, the most glaring ones, I, I read two articles in the New York Times this month. One talked about how we have a 3.8 million housing unit shortage. Two weeks later, it talked about how builders are starting to pull back on projects and actually deliver less housing units. How many industries are there where you have a massive market, you have growing demand, and you have a decreasing supply? It's a market dynamic that is really pretty unique to this industry in general. And I don't think you can necessarily blame the builders, just the way the numbers pencil out they run a business, they have to run a profitable business. And the most profitable projects are those that are higher end or luxury type projects. And when you run out of those buyers, their natural inclination is to pull back rather than trying to deliver more to the middle market. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we are going to see that. And, you know, we have this pending, looming, you know, recession, depression, whatever anybody wants to call it, you know, and I think that's part of why people start getting nervous and scared on top of labor shortages, oil, prices and all of that that have gone through the through the roof lately. So when we talk about in, you know incremental innovation, disruptive innovation, we talk about innovation in the built environment and why we're lagging behind and all these different things. Will we have somebody that comes in and actually disrupts this industry? I, I think we have to. We are at a, a moment right now where uh, the industry is largely, I think, going to either adopt and disrupt itself and find a new path forward, or the challenges we just spoke about are only gonna get worse and they're gonna get harder to operate and you're gonna get less companies that are able to successfully 
run a business within this industry. So what, what in your mind, uh, what category is the emerging category for disruption in, in the built environment right now? I think without a question, the sector that has the most potential is industrial construction. Um, if you look at virtually every single technology that's emerging within this space, um, whether we're talking about AI and machine learning, big data, generative and computational design, um, sustainability and clean tech, they are all exponentially more valuable if placed in the context of an industry that is operated with industrial construction as its focus. So if we get into this and let's start breaking down, you know, the categories, right? One of the categories that we talked about is the developer. What's your thoughts? So developers at the end of the day, they're the customer for a lot of us. Uh, and developers, like a lot of other companies out there, they're beholden to investors. And investors are investing in developer funds that show the greatest return. And so as an industry, how do we increase the value proposition to those investors and provide them a greater return on the projects that they're working on. It's two simple things are the, the fastest way to pull those levers. One is deliver faster and two is deliver cheaper. And if you can prove those two right. metrics, investors are going to make more money and they'll put more money into these types of projects. $10 tomorrow is better than $10 a year from now. Yeah, true. Right. Heads on beds. The faster we can get them open and running, the better it is. You never know what yeah. tomorrow is going to bring for sure. Now, how about the designer side of this? Uh, so the architects in general, uh, it's going to be a pretty disruptive to, I think, not so much the work they do, but how they do the work and how they charge for the work that they do. Um, and, and this thought isn't original to me. I've, I've heard others talk about it before, but it's a, a value realignment for them. Uh, how do they change the fees that they charge to more align with the value they create for projects? More time in that early upfront phases of what should this project be used for? How should it be used? Um, and how can we design around that and less time billing, designing a stairwell or a doorway entryway detail? Do we see more, do, do we see more of a need or less of a need for traditional design uh, work moving forward with industrialized construction when it comes to the designers, the architects, the draftsmen out there, or does it just shift for them to a different, I think different process? I I think it shifts to a different process. And if I was a designer, I would be excited because it allows them to apply more creativity yeah. around what a project could actually be, how it could be used and in less time around, again, the, the more mundane tasks of what a lot of their responsibility comes with today. Got it. So we talked about the developer. We talked about the designer. How about building products? How, how do they play a role in all of this? Building products today are designed for the on-site construction process, right? So um, they are then manufactured by a building product manufacturer, sent out to distributors who then feed out to job sites all across the country. Um, and those products are designed to be installed by a team of people on site. So as a, a simple example, a piece of drywall, for instance, comes in a size that two people on site can pick it up and put it on a wall and install it. Well, if you have a robot picking up that piece of drywall, you can make a lot bigger piece of drywall. And so um, there's, there's a lot of implications there around just rethinking the form and function in which building products are actually developed. I think more interestingly, though, is how new building products are actually adopted within the industry. It's a real challenge. And if you talk to any startup within this space, it is literally hand-to-hand -hand combat, project to project. Con contractor to contractor trying to get their new material adopted on a specific one job. That's a very yeah. painful way to scale a business. Um, industrial construction provides a context where we can test much faster um, and see how that product performs against old products. And we also present a way of standardizing how those products are used so that we can deploy it across multiple projects instead of just a single project. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense when we look at some of the manufacturers out there, product suppliers, product developers out there. And as we start seeing this shift towards more industrialized construction, manufactured, modular, whatever we want to call it, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to have four by eight sheets of anything anymore. Right. If we're right. using that process, when you can have when you can have a machine lift a 10 by 30 foot sheet, which is going to reduce lumber, take down shear walls, all the other stuff that that falls into that. But even, even more important, 
it, it allows the workforce to work longer, put more years in if they choose to do so. And it has less wear and tear on their bodies as well. I mean, there, there's two sides to all of this. Yeah. And I mean, it, a couple points to that, talking about the workforce, how do you get a rejuvenated workforce entering this space, a new labor pool coming into this space? I think one, you need to demonstrate that you're solving a really big problem that has really big solutions and a lot of potential. You have to excite that future workforce and that future labor force. Nobody was going to work in the automotive industry before Tesla came around and presented this whole new challenge around electric vehicles and the electrification of that. Now you have an entire tech movement moving into the automotive industry that traditionally was not going into that space. And industrial construction really presents that I think broadly across the entire building industry, um, you want to know how to get more clean, sustainable building products into buildings and different types of people working on that problem, present a path for them to create a successful business around it. And you're going to see a lot more excitement and a lot more companies trying to come into this space. Hey, it's always sunny and 70 inside the manufacturing facility, right? Whether you're in Canada or you're in the Carolinas or wherever that may be. All right, listen, everybody, if you're just joining us right now, we have Brian Sayer, VP of Business Development from Builds on with us today. And we are talking about the industry and the future of it. So where it's going, if you have a question, put a cue in front of that question. It'll make it much easier for us to find it as we go through the comments or just let us know where you're joining in from today. All right, Brian, we got a lot to cover and we're actually at the end of the show. We're really going to get into some good points and a good conversation. So if you're in this industry, looking to enter this industry, you're a startup. Uh, Brian's going to give us some tips on on where this is going uh, and how to how to really be successful and things you should be looking at. So you definitely want to stick around until uh, the end today, wouldn't you say, Brian? Oh yeah, we just touched the surface. We got three more episodes to go. <laughs> three more episodes. I love it. Let's do it. All right. So disruption in industrialized construction. Build with less risk or construct with less risk. Talk to me about this. Uh, so uh, on the contractor side, a lot of their job is risk management and risk mitigation. And a lot of the challenge of that job is, to be frank, crappy data. Um, they necessarily can't look back at historical projects and figure out how to make their next project less risky. Uh, and so how do you fix that? Well, you create more standardized, repeatable, higher quality data that can then be applied to inform better projects in the future. And you also create a more standardized process behind how you actually construct assets so that every single one is in a unicorn and a learning process behind it. Um, and in doing so, therefore, you can reduce the risk that's associated with any sort of new projects going forward. And why, why can't we look back at previous data the way we've been doing it? Just curious in your mind why, you know, it, it makes so, every other industry uses data to make decisions, except mm -hmm. For ours, but what what has been the roadblock on that? We got a lot of new people watching this show, just so they understand. Yeah. The, there's um again, it's a loaded question. Uh, a, a big one is the number of stakeholders involved on any project and having people yeah. intern data. So your data is only going to be as good as the person that's managing it. You might have a really good um, uh, project manager that really keeps great detailed notes, logs everything, but the way that he's logging that data isn't going to be the same way that the same project manager at the same company working on a different project is logging that. So it's inconsistent in the way in which it's actually input. You also have the contractor and then hundreds sometimes of subcontractors coming into a project. And so you need all of their data to also inform the project. You also have all of the data that the designers and the engineers were using when upfront creating that project that has to be passed through. Um, so the, the handoff and the transition of it between all of the different stakeholders at any point involved on the project is it's a real mess. Yeah. So if we're collecting this data, not only as we build a project, but as people are living in it, what kind of value, I guess, is this adding to, you know, to the occupants of, of the project, right? So we're collecting data so we can build it better. But even after somebody moves in, we can still collect data so we can keep redesigning better based on how people live or use the product that we're building. Is that accurate? hundred percent. It's, it's higher quality. Um, of construction because you're doing it through a more repeatable type process. So the end assets can last longer. You can create ways to um, actually bring the BIM all the way through from the design implementation all the way through operation. So if you do need to make updates or change around your building, you know exactly where everything is and how to retrofit it and, and make it better. 
Uh, so there's a lot of benefits through this and all the different kind of stakeholders we just talked through that eventually get passed down to the owner and operator of these end, um, end buildings. So, you know, and, and when we're constantly improving our process, when we're using more industrialized construction machinery, robots, um, BIM, right, AI, VR, all this stuff, it allows us to make more intelligent decisions, which in turn, I guess, really is going to work out for not only the, the investor and the developer as being more profitable because they can streamline their process, they can deliver a better product, more people buy their product. And then the people that are in the homes actually enjoy where they're living versus, oh, I wish we would have thought of that. And it's a I really novel is, concept. <laughs> <laughs> right? Who am, am I picking up what you're putting down here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you're pitching sounds great. Sign me up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, but I think, I think that's what it's really all about, right? Is how do we, how do we, how do we build and do more with less? Cause we're losing the labor force. How do we attract the labor force? All right. Labor force, man. I, I, computers are sexy. Cameras are sexy. I like all my stuff that I play with every day, you know, and I always want the latest and greatest. Um, but construction is not that for the younger generation, but by bringing all of this together, it's not only going to help us bring in the new labor force, it's not only to help us be uh, better builders, more sustainable builders, healthier homes, happier consumers. Um, it's also going to help us get to an affordability level because we can be very efficient at what we're doing so we can so we can build uh, houses, uh, I guess, for the mass markets and make it attainable and affordable again. Yep, exactly. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. So. Who's going to be the disruptor? Uh, that's the million dollar question, billion dollar question. Um, and it, it's, I think why, you know, even after what we went through with Katera recently, why you still see investors making record investments within the industrial construction sector. I mean, just within this year alone, even with everything else that's going on, we've seen new, very large scale investments into industrial construction companies in this space. And it's because investors they're looking for home runs. And when I say investors right. in this case, I mean, venture capital community, private equity, family offices, corporate investors, um, they, they're looking for home runs, companies that are gonna have a, a billion plus dollar valuation in the future. And so they're looking for the sector that has the most disruptive potential and to be able to achieve that. And so that's why they continue to make investments within this space. Um, but no player has emerged yet that's had the Apple effect or the Tesla effect on the built industry. It's, it's still relatively greenfield and, and wide open for somebody to go out and win. Is it going to be somebody inside or outside of the industry? Or is it going to be a mix kind of like a hybrid like yourself? I, I think it's probably going to be a, a hybrid or outsider. Rarely mm -hmm. ever do you see an insider be the disruptor. They're usually the disrupted. Um, and the main reason for that is disrupting your own business model is a hard pill to swallow. Uh, it yeah. typically doesn't look well on investors uh, when, and by that, I mean like it's institutional investors investing in the stock market. If you're going to pitch, so you're going to disrupt your entire business model and change the way everything's been done. For sure. For sure. I saw a question pop up here. Steve Burrows. What's happening, Steve Burrows? Good to see you. How does UX inform industrialization of construction? Um, I'm not exactly sure about that one. The and I assume he's talking the the user experience there I, yeah, is sure. that really web based where you know in, envisioning customers buying a building more like they buy a car than how they actually purchase a building today I, I think that's probably where that experience is eventually going to go I think if you look at the rise of the metaverse and things like that there could be a lot of really interesting experiential. Um, experiences that emerge that kind of change the way that uh, people make decisions around what they're buying and why. Sure. All right, everybody, if you're just tuning in with us, stick around. We're going to get into some things you need to be looking at, paying attention to, and or understanding if uh, you're coming into this industry, you want to change the industry, you want to bring great ideas to this industry. In just a moment, but first, we're going to say hello to a few people. All right, all the way from YouTube, from Australia, very early morning, 3 a.m. here, but didn't want to miss it. Neil, uh, I believe you say Waipur, Waipire. I don't know, but hopefully I'm not messing it up too much for you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. 
Uh, we got Amanda Alexander joining us from Scottsdale, Arizona. Stream Logistics in the house. Hey, one of our sponsors. Hey, Brian, if you haven't met with Stream Logistics, you and your team should meet with them. They're, they're actually bringing tech uh, to the logistics side of things. So I highly recommend you have that conversation. They're young and they're having a lot of fun with it. So super cool. Great, great for logistics. Hey, Gregory, what's happening? Good afternoon, Dave. Good to see you. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Um, love it, love it, love it. We got Henry Mickelberg out there. Anarchy is much maligned term. If we're chopping at high acral systems, aka waste, then it's all good. I uh, don't know if you know Henry, but never short on words. Good to see you, Henry. I love it. I love it. All right. Steve Burrows, I figured you'd be in on this conversation quite a bit. Uh, I do want to read some of these comments because he always has something great to say. Construction creates products that last 60 to 100 years and must remain safe despite appropriate maintenance. It's pretty impressive and innovation is being driven by lack of labor, climate change and affordability, not because it's messed up. You agree with that, Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Listen, if you're joining us, please hit that like and share button. We got some other comments in there and we'll get to those in a minute uh, for sure. Time goes fast on this show. We're almost at uh, 40 after here. So let's talk about this. You know, what is the formula for being a disruptor in your mind? What what do people need to be looking at? This this is the goodies, everybody. Put your put your uh, thinking caps on, put your headsets in and start listening and start writing. So what do you think is a creating a viable, scalable, disruptive business going to take? First of all, it's, it's big picture vision. Uh, you need to present a vision that is large and shows an ability to grow within that space vertically. So within your own industry and then also horizontally as well. So how can you enter into new spaces? Um, but to get that across and grow that business, you have to show also at the same time a focus on how you're going to get there. And so where do you actually start? And then how does that starting point enable you to enter into all of those other spaces? Right. So let's talk about that and break it down. Let's define it, hone it, test it. What is the market size? How do we do it? Yeah, so um, it, we can use a, a bunch of different companies as examples. We spoke about Tesla a, a couple of times today, so I'll use them as the first. If, if they looked at what their total addressable market is, that's the, the largest market that they could potentially go after. That's all car owners. The next layer in is your service addressable market. So those are all car owners that want an electric car. And then even more focused than that, your service obtainable market is all car owners that want a luxury electric car. And if you look at where Tesla is in their growth cycle or, or where they are in their stage as a company, they started out with the Roadster, which was their car owners that want a luxury electric car. And by entering into that space, they were able to deliver a single product, learn how to deliver that single product very well to those target audience. And then through their learnings, we're able to create a lower priced car. And so now they're out of stage where they're able to present different price points for different audiences that want an electric car across the board. So not just a luxury one. And so it's a, it's a similar model when you look at the built environment, hone in first on who your first customer is going to be, but then show how you can attract more customers in a bigger market as you grow. And, and I'm going to ask you this because I already know you, you know, the answer um, not that it's a simple question, but Tesla, are they a disruptor in the industry with their electric car or is it something else? I think it's something else. Uh, similar to the Apple story. It wasn't the smartphone. It was the app store. Uh, with Tesla, it was less to do with the electric car and more to do with the way in which they went to market. And this is where you typically see the disruption. It's, it's a business model change that gives them a competitive advantage over the incumbents. And for Tesla, what that was, was the elimination of dealerships. They knew that if they went to market trying to establish dealerships, they didn't really stand a chance going toe to toe with Toyota, Ford, Chevrolet, and these other massive incumbent car manufacturers that had dealerships globally around the world. And so what did they do? Instead, they went direct to customer. And that business model initiative and that business model change is then what enabled the rise of companies like Rivian and now if you go to buy the new Ford Lightning, you place a pre-order online. So the incumbents stole a page directly out of their page, out of their playbook. Appreciate that. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Pitching to investors. What do we need to be looking at? 
How do we get there? What do they care about? Because you were you sat on both sides of this uh, fence for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it goes back to one the the market size. Investors need to see a big market. That's your first and immediate goal. Um, but with that large market, they also want to see that you have a very focused plan on how you're going to first get market traction within that market that you've defined. So back to the Tam, Sam, Sam example we were talking about earlier, um, show a focused effort on this is where I'm going to start. This is what my growth within that space looks like. And then expand from there. Um, this is how I'm going to attract more customers in the future and enable even more growth. Um, what that's doing for them is it's showing a return on their investment and they can start to then put forward revenue projections and figure out what this actually means for them. Um, yeah. A couple other little quick distinguishers, how you actually brand your company matters. So how you talk about it, how you're able to communicate your value and your value proposition. Um, and then I think one of the most important ones is your team. You know, there's a lot of companies that are probably working on a very similar problem to what you're working on. You are probably not unique in your startup approach. Uh, so demonstrate why you're the team that's going to win and why you're the team that they should bet on and not the 10, 50, 100 other companies that are working on a really similar solution. Sure. Uh, and, you know, and, and is, it, is, it so, is, it, is it a simple thing to do? I mean, it's, it's simple to talk about. It sounds easy to do, but is it really easy to, to, to build something like this? In your no, mind? No, no, not at all. And and, yeah. and none of them are. I, I think the, the biggest challenge for all of these companies is that first pitch and getting that first seed investor to come in. Yeah. Because at that stage, you have very little proof of concept. You have very little proof of growth, very little revenue coming in. And so it's a belief in your concept. The problem you're trying to solve is big. And the value that you're creating is different enough from what others are providing. And that's just very, very hard to do. Sure. Brian, what, what didn't we talk about today? What, what did we miss? Did I miss anything? Do you want, is there, is there some brilliant uh, idea you want to throw out there? <laughs> um, you can say honestly, no. No, <laughs> I, I, we covered a ton really quickly. Yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm surprised you know, we're at 40 minutes. That time flew by, but we covered a lot of notes today. Yeah. Well, I think it's important for, for everybody to understand out there, Brian, what you're doing, you know, the company you're currently working uh, with, you know, and the team that you're on and the team that you're building, um, you know, I, you're, you're trying to do everything almost that we talked about, it sounds like today, right? You're trying to bring that innovation. You're trying to think differently about how we design, how we build, how we deliver, how we collect data, right? And I'm, I'm assuming this is all the things you're working on. Uh, and I think that's what's really going to be impressive, uh, you know, moving forward and watching what you're doing as well. So um, Jen says there's a couple more comments there. Let's take a look at what we have uh, going on and I will go through these. So one second here. All right. Amanda Alexander, Brian, are you spearheading any initiatives to inspire and include the voice of young people in your company, meaning offering internships, partnering with high schools or colleges on credit hours, et cetera? Great question. Um, so not as much currently, uh, but it's definitely in the roadmap and in the process, uh, specifically engaging with colleges and universities. We talked about the labor force a little bit earlier, uh, and unfortunately, well, not necessarily unfortunately, but universities and even trade and labor programs are still structuring their education curriculum around the on-site existing process. And uh, if we're going to create this new vibrant labor pool in the future, we need to be educating them on this new process that we're trying to develop. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for that. And we're really excited to engage with that in the near term future when, when we start to, to ramp up and really expand our hiring within the company. Yeah, for sure. And I can tell everybody out there watching, there is a lot of great opportunity and education that is in the works that will be coming out to talk about industrialized construction, offsite manufacturing, whatever we want to call it around the globe. So stay tuned because I think people are going to get very excited over the next couple quarters when they see some of these things popping up. So super cool. All right, Steve Burrows, developers are a marketplace connecting money to demand. There are other ways to accomplish this. The market dynamics of construction are boom bust due to interest rates and the close relationship to recession. And so this counterweights industrialization as its capital intense. Sure. Yeah. Yep. 
All right, Juan Carlos Cabrero. Hey, Juan, good to see you. We could build faster, cheaper, but maybe disruption could come with better performance in many areas and flexible spaces adapt to customers with the time. Yeah, we were kind of talking about that a little bit earlier in, in some aspect, uh, uh, Brian, in regards to if we collect the data, we can constantly improve the user and user experience throughout. And I, I think where that comes from is the incremental innovation once the disruption has taken place. We need to get to a starting point where there's a proven process for how to deliver faster and cheaper. And once yeah. you have that in place, the, the opportunity for new innovation within that, it's going to ignite. And if people think there's a lot of new technology emerging within the construction space right now, let's revisit this conversation a decade from now. And it's going to be a completely different landscape. Yeah. So how, how many more years is that then, Brian? we got to wait. Yeah, you gotta, I think you gotta, gotta, be, you gotta be next year. You gotta be patient. That's what I tell people about builds. Just patience. Just, just patience. <laughs> be patient. I mean, hey, great things take time, right? Um, and a lot of thought. But I think you know we're starting to see change happen. But I agree with you. I think ten years it will be a completely different conversation and a different picture. All right, here we go. Uh, Enrico Nietes Marquez. Hi, hello everyone. How do you? Uh, okay, what do you think about the Spanish market, Brian? Nowadays the handwork is so cheap. So. You know, in, in markets where the labor is less expensive um, and more affordable, is that going to hinder or slow down the progress of industrialized construction globally or not? I, I think it still brings enough value in other aspects of the entire process that maybe it doesn't check the labor mark bu bucket, but it will check yeah. enough other ones that you can still differentiate the value proposition to, to make it resonate. Sure. All right, this will be our last question, uh, Brian. This is uh, from Wade Nolan on YouTube. Has an industrialized construction company that took on a bunch of VC money ever been successful? Anybody you know? Uh, I think it depends on how you define success. Uh, yeah. There is a lot of companies out there that have raised a lot of venture money. They're still in business. They're still growing and they're still raising more venture funding. Um, I wouldn't define them as the disruptor yet. So they haven't answered all the questions or reached a point of stabilization where they don't need venture funding anymore. Uh, so I would say not yet, but soon. It's coming. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely coming for sure. You know, and, and Katera being the, you know, the, the, the big, the big horse in the room, if they want to call it that uh, a lot of great things came out of it. And I think oh, 100%. It's, it, and it's so emerging how many things now we're learning every day, new stuff that they've actually yeah. come up with. And you need companies to spearhead and trailblaze and fail for others to then follow and learn from right. those mistakes to be successful. So you don't get Facebook without MySpace. There's, there's examples in every single industry that you look at with companies that tried it before, weren't as successful, but others were able to adopt it, make it better. And then eventually somebody gets it right. And I think this next crop of companies we have emerging in the space are the ones that are going to do it. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. And that's why we're here. So if you're out there and you're watching this show, we want to hear from you. If you're, if you're looking at Disrupt the Space, you got a new product, you got a new idea that's going to help us build it better. We'd like to hear from you on this show as well. We are booked out quite a ways. But other than that, bring it on. We want to know more about it. We want to connect you with people like Brian. Everything we do on this show is for you to connect with everybody else that's out there because we need to start talking to each other, communicating with each other and building better together because that's going to take all of us to get to the next level. Brian, thank you so much for uh, coming on today. Thanks for having me, Dave. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. And super, super uh, much success uh, to you and the team at Builds. We're excited to talk about that in the near future as well. And for everybody else out there, have a wonderful Monday, and we will see you this Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Dave Cooper, and that right over there is Brian Sayers. We'll see you guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks.